more than your greatness here, God, more than our ability to play music and preach the word. God, we want your greatness here. So bless Caleb. Give him your words. Amen. <laughs> it's all yours, bro. And thank you, John. It's so good to be here. I, John was the bass player on my worship team at IHOP. I'm a, I'm a worship leader at IHOP, and I teach in our internship programs. And yeah, and I, I enjoy it. I love it. And uh, it was a joy to have John and his family as part of the team for what, close to three years. About three years, we spent time together every day. And I mean, that's a good thing and a bad thing. <laughs> you know, sometimes, because we did 6 a.m.s, okay? We did two 6 a.m.s a week. We'd be there at 5.30. And Tuesday 6 a.m. was one of the ones we did. And uh, John and his family would take family day on Monday, right? And one Monday, they went to Worlds of Fun, which is a... Uh, like a, it's a theme park, right? There's it's called Worlds of Fun and Oceans of Fun. They go down water slides and all that stuff. And and I simply asked one simple question that any normal human would just answer. I'm just giving you a little insight into who your director really is. <laughs> this is how on this is how you honor John. And that's what I'm doing right now is I'm honoring him. But. <laughs> Hit the mute button. It's a small room. I can still, they can still hear me. <laughs> but uh, I asked John, I said, man, it was, pretty, was it, it was pretty hot yesterday, right? And you know, just trying to be like a nice guy of casual conversation. You know, it was, it was hot yesterday. He's like, I don't know if you, you think it was hot. And he pulls his shirt all the way up. Red, sunburnt chest and belly just... And I'm like, it is way too early for that. I don't, I'm going to have to go sing to Jesus now. Like now? Really? So we always, we always make jokes now. Every time I'm with John, we make the joke, and keep your shirt on. Just keep, he starts getting worked up, keep your shirt on, John. Just, let's just settle down, keep your shirt on. So I love John and his family. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you his kids, Sadie and James. They, they did some work for me around my house. They cut my grass. I mean, I paid them. I paid them, okay? I paid them. What? Daddy took a cut, yeah. We all know he did. But he bought the gas, right? So they cut my grass. They shoveled rocks for me. They did all kinds of stuff. I mean, these are hardworking kids. It's good to have them as part of something like this, right? Because we want people with work ethic. Because it takes work, right, to build something. And so, it, it, yeah, I just love this family, and that's why I'm here. I don't know any of you guys, but I know John and Angela and their family, and I know Andrew, and uh, that's enough for me to want to come here. Because you guys must be pretty awesome if you hang around with people like this. So uh, just a little bit about me, and then we're going to... What, what, where are we going to today? Like about what time? The, the morning? About noon. Okay. Well, that's, that's, that we got over an hour, so we got plenty of time. Uh, so, thank you. Man, look at this. I got like a whole, like little office up here. This is great. Thank you. That's great. Great. Thank you, Brad. I know he's not here. But, um, no, just a little bit about me, So, because uh, we're going to be talking a lot today and uh, spending a lot of time together. It's going to be fun. I'm going to enjoy it. I hope you do. And I, uh, I just want you guys to know a little bit who I am, and then hopefully throughout the day I'll get a chance to talk to some of y'all and get to know a little bit about who you are. But um, my, uh, my, my wife and I have been married for 13 years. We're originally from North Carolina. I don't know if you could tell. I don't sound like y'all. <laughs> <laughs> I'm originally from North Carolina, and uh, but I moved in 2013 uh, to Kansas City. Why would I move to Kansas City? Kansas City is not exactly beautiful, right? It's not exactly uh, something that, you know, not a lot of people are thinking, hey, I kind of want to move somewhere cool. Where should I go? Kansas. <laughs> you know? 
That's not really. And in fact, Kansas City isn't even in Kansas. I don't know if y'all knew that, <laughs> but <laughs> it's in Missouri. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I didn't know that. But, you know, I mean, it's kind of confusing, isn't it? But anyway, uh, I got introduced to International House of Prayer in Kansas City back in 2005. And um, it was basically, I'd just gotten saved. I was planning to go to be a medical research doctor, like a medical, like a research scientist doctor. So I was going to go to UNC Chapel Hill, scholarship, the whole deal. That was my plan. Um, I was a smarty pants in high school, right? I thought I knew everything. Uh, and so the Lord, uh, through a friend, a friend started inviting me to go to church. Now, I grew up in a fundamental Baptist church in the South, okay? I don't know if any of y'all are familiar with fundamental Baptist, but fundamental Baptist is like KJV only, wear a tie. If, you pl- if, if it's anything but a piano or an organ, then it's from the devil, right? If you have drums, you are going to hell. There's no question. If you wear a hat inside the church building, you're going to hell. Like these guys, these guys, they're all going to hell. Like it's a mortal sin to wear a hat, you know? And so I grew up in that kind of church. And and, and now now don't hear me knocking it. There was such a, 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 a value for the word of God in that church that it at least, it gave me those roots and the appreciation for uh, the Word of God. The, it's important that everything we do be informed by this book and guided by this book. If it's not, then we're just a weed tossed in the wind, right? We just don't know what we're doing or where we're going, and it's just life is a whole lot better when we abide within a concrete truth called the Word of God. But I hated church. You know, I just didn't like it. I didn't like, I I was okay with Jesus because he seemed nice enough. But like church, like I I just didn't, I'm like, why am I going to go to the same place every week and listen to the same guy yell at me, tell me how terrible I am and that I'm going to hell. Like hellfire and brimstone sermon every week, right? Why, what's the point in that? Why is that? And I still don't know really what's the point in that, (laughs) you know? So I was pretty much done like by the towards the end of my teenage years. I was like, as soon as I go off to college, I'm not I'm not doing this church thing anymore. And so um, a friend of a friend of mine named Kip. Okay, everybody in their life has a Kip. Okay, and Kip is the friend that you have that you don't know why you have them. (laughs) You know what I mean? Like, why are we friends? (laughs) Anybody have a friend like that? Like you spend time with them and you're like, it's, you're just like, I don't, why do we hang out? <laughs> you know, Andrew's my kip now. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. I was thinking I was going to say. He was going to say, I beat you to it. See, my discernment is off the charts because my soul is prospering. <laughs> kept bugging me about going to his youth group and we didn't really have youth group I mean we had youth group but youth group was everybody under the age of 21 including like two-year-olds and it was where they got together and tried to tell me that my NIV teen bible they sat me down for two hours to, to persuade me that I needed to throw away my NIV teen bible and so I'm like why would I want to go to a youth group and so he kept, he's like, no, man, he's like, it's, it's cool. We have fun. We drink like Coca-Cola through socks and stuff. And I'm like, what does that mean? <laughs> you know, all the youth group stuff, the stupid games. And uh, finally, I got, I was pretty, you know, I, I was pretty smart. I feel like I'm kind of a smart guy. And so I decided, well, here's, here's a good relational hack. If you tell someone yes one time, then they'll leave you alone about it after that. <laughs> and so he kept bugging me. Finally, I'm like, okay, I'll go one time. And so I went, and that, uh, he introduces me to his youth pastor. And his youth pastor is wearing a North Carolina Tar Heels uh, baseball cap backwards. And I'm like, he's wearing a hat in church, and it's backwards? This, going, this dude's going to hell twice. <laughs> like, <laughs> that's how, I mean, that was my perception. Like, I, honest truth. Like, I mean, I didn't really think that, but that was what I grew up in. So... But immediately my guard came down, you know, because I saw someone who was a little bit more like me, just normal, you know, who wasn't, 
a different person inside of a church building than they were outside of a church building. Their identity was consistent, you know? And so when, so I leaned in a little bit and I was willing to listen. I was willing to pay attention. And he preached this sermon that night where he was holding this, uh, this little vase and it had a monkey painted on the front of it. That's an insignificant detail that I'm giving you because I remember it. Uh, and he's holding this vase the entire night and he's talking about being a vessel that God wants to fill. Being a vessel that God wants to fill. God wants to fill you with his presence. He wants to fill you with his glory. He wants to fill you so that you have something to offer the world, so that you can live from an overflow of the power of God being poured into you. He wants to make you, shape you, turn you into a vessel for his glory and for your good. And at the end of that sermon, he holds the vessel up and he says, at kind of the crescendo of his message, he says, but here's the thing. Before God can make you into the vessel he needs to fill, he first needs to break you. And he drops this vase on the ground and it shatters. He needs to break you of everything that you are now so that you can step into this new identity. And there's a little shard of glass that slid across the concrete floor to the second row where I was sitting underneath the chair and it landed right between my feet and it's like it sparkled at me and in that moment I had the strangest desire I'd ever felt inside ever I felt I want to be that I want to be that broken piece of glass <laughs> if that means that in his hand he can shape me and make me into something that he can fill and I gave my life to the to Jesus that night and uh, within a month, I knew. Uh, I started reading the Bible because he gave me a Bible that I could understand. And uh, and I started reading it. And, you know, when someone gives you a book that you've never really been interested in before, it kind of just like, okay, where do I start? You just start at the beginning, right? Like every other book, just start at the beginning and read it through. So that's what I was doing. I started and I started reading. And I'm like, man, there's a lot of begats, begats in here. But I finally got to, I finally got to Exodus 22, the Ten Commandments, and uh, it was the first time I would say I had revelation, right? Like the words on the page jumped out and hit me in the heart. It's when I read the commandment, which I knew it. I knew the Ten Commandments. I grew up in church. We talked about them. Um, but it was the first time I read that passage, I'll have no other God, you shall have no other gods before me, and it hit my heart. You know, like I, it, it, I knew it in my head before, but this time it hit my heart. And I realized my education had become my God my entire life. What I wanted was, you know, it, it kept me in good moral character, right? I didn't go out and do dumb stuff like my friends did, like drink and party and drugs and do all the stupid stuff that, you know, some teenagers do and some of my friends did. I didn't do that stuff because I didn't want to ruin my future, my opportunity to get a scholarship, my opportunity to get a good paying job, my opportunities to do all those things. Those things kept me motivated. Those things kept me out of trouble. Those things gave me purpose. Those things gave me meaning. Those things gave me identity. Those things were idols. I was worshiping them. And they were producing a measure of good things in my life, just like every idol does. Sin is pleasurable and good for a season, but it will take you further than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and cost you more than you want to pay. Right? And so that was, <laughs> that was my story, and I felt the Lord saying, I want you to turn the scholarship offered down. I want you to take all your high school credits, apply for early graduation, and go get a job. And I'm like, what are you talking about, Lord? Like, that's totally opposite of my plan. And he's like, exactly. That's the point. <laughs> and so I wrestled with that for a while. I wrote my parents a letter explaining to them what I was thinking about doing because I couldn't imagine having a face-to-face -face conversation with them about that. You know, them me this is all I was ever going to do and now they're like like you know I'm thinking I'm going to tell them I'm literally going to go get a job at a tire shop like after I was going to be a research doctor you know and they're like you know I wrote the letter and surprisingly the Lord um like put it in their hearts to be massively supportive <laughs> and they were like 
if we don't understand it, but if this is the Lord, then we're not going to stand in his way. And so I graduated early. I went and uh, got a job at a tire shop and started applying for looking into uh, like seminary because I was an intellectual, right? Like my mindset was, well, if I'm going to do this, I got to go get the education for it. You know what I mean? And uh, every, everywhere that I was looking, it was like, this doesn't feel right, this doesn't feel right, this doesn't feel right. And so uh, finally, a friend of mine, uh, the, actually the youth pastor, the guy that I got saved under, and he discipled me and everything, uh, he asked me to start leading worship about a month or two into me being saved because he discovered that I could play like three chords on a guitar and could sing a little bit. And that's how most worship leaders in most churches get started is they're the only person that can do it. And so, hey, you're the worship leader now. So <laughs> the guy that was doing it before me couldn't play guitar, but he played guitar. You know what I mean? <laughs> he literally would stand up there and just put his fingers in random places and strum. And it was like playing in the key of X, I think is what he was doing. <laughs> and he was terrible. He was really terrible. Uh, and I don't, I'm, I'm a nice guy. I don't say that about most people, but he was really terrible. Uh, <laughs> and so I was like, yeah, if it's better than that, then I will, I mean, I'm, I know I can do better than that. So I started worship leading and about a year into worship leading, I, I, I began to lead worship some in the Sunday morning services as well, uh, at that church. And, um, after one of the services, the senior pastor and the youth pastor, they came up to me and they said, hey, Caleb, so in a couple of weeks, we found out about this place that's been doing prayer with worship 24 hours a day, seven days a week. At that time, it was for like six years, since 1999. Now it's been almost 23 years that, that IHOP KC has been going 24-7. And so they're like, we're going to go out there in like two weeks for a weekend uh, just to go to their prayer room and then do a couple of seminars that they're that they're doing. Uh, would you like to come? And I'm like, worship 24-7? I'm kind of into that right now. That's sort of my thing. It's what I'm doing. So, yeah, I'd love to. So I went and, uh, and walked into that prayer room for the first time with no grid of what to expect. I did not know what I was getting myself into at all. But I walked in there. It was about 10 o'clock in the morning. We got there. And I just got hit by the presence of God the second I walked in. I just got wrecked. Like, uh, I don't get super emotional typically, but I got, like, super emotional. I'm like, that's a sign that something's going on. And so I sat down, uh, and just all I knew was I want to read the Bible. Like, I just want to read the Bible. That's what I felt. I sat down, I started reading the Word and praying and praying the Word back to God, and I would read things, and I would turn it into conversation with God. It was just happening. I'm like, this is the weirdest thing I've ever done this. I started doing that, and and I uh, started to get, it felt like an hour had went by, and I started to get hungry. I'm like, man, I'm kind of getting hungry, so I, like, uh, walk over to JR, the youth pastor that was there with me. I'm like, hey, man, can we go get something to eat sometime soon? Like, it doesn't have to be now. I know we've only been here, like, an hour, and he's like, yeah. He's like, I'm kind of getting hungry, too. So he grabs his flip phone out of his bag, and he flips it open, and he looks, and it's 4 o'clock in the afternoon. We'd been in that room for six hours. I thought it was like an hour. I'm like, I have never spent an hour talking to God. And I just spent six hours reading the Bible and talking to God. And the only reason I want to leave is because I'm hungry, not because I'm bored. I was like, man, there's something, something different is going on in the atmosphere here. And because of that, something different started going on in me. Now, I'm not saying IHOP KC is special, right? The presence of God is everywhere. Anywhere the people of God are, the presence of God is there. So it's not IHOP, but it was something about people who were loving God, being loved by God, loving his word, doing it in community with other believers, worshiping him in spirit and in truth. Simple devotion. They weren't complicating things. I mean, I knew a little bit about music, and I knew when I walked in, the girl up there was only playing four chords the entire time. The same four chords. They would sing the same chorus for 10 minutes straight, right? I'd get yelled at for doing that at the church where I led worship. You know, not yelled at, but 
that's not real. That, that's kind of, I don't know. I'm like, y'all are going to be real bored in heaven. Holy, 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 holy is the Lord for a billion years. <laughs> okay. So if you got a problem with repetition, then you got a problem with heaven. But I was a little bit arrogant back then. Uh, <laughs> But I, I just like, so what I'm saying is it wasn't back then, John. John, keep your shirt on. <laughs> uh, now you got me off track. I'm kidding. So it was simple devotion, and I felt like the Lord said, Caleb, that's all I really want from you. I don't want you to do anything extravagant. I don't, you don't need to have four degrees. You don't need to do all that. Just love my word, love me, worship me in spirit and in truth, and do it with other people, and I will teach you everything you need to know about everything I have called you to do. And so I just said yes. I just said yes, and the Lord downloaded me into me a supernatural hunger for this book. Before I was interested, that day I became hungry. I was st- Starved for what was in this book because I had this realization that this book is not so much about learning uh, educational principles or thoughts or ideas or morals or any of that stuff. I mean, it's good for that, but that's not what it's about. From Genesis 1 to Revelation 22, every single word, jot, and tittle in this book is a gigantic neon sign pointing to the revelation of one man who is Jesus, who is the lover of my soul, the savior of my spirit, and the redeemer of my life. And when I realized that, this book suddenly became so much less boring because it became this mysterious journey of, I got to discover more about a person through the words in this book. Imagine the Genesis 1 creator God who spoke and light came forth, gave you a book and said, if you will eat this, then you can know me and become like me. If we have that revelation of the value of this book, then it changes everything. And so I became obsessed with the Bible. I would keep a New Testament in my back pocket, a psalm in my other back pocket. There's Bible in my car, Bible in my bag, Bible in my locker at the tire shop. Like I would go and I would go in. There was this guy named Herbie. Okay, this guy worked with Herbie. I worked with him every day. He had three teeth. Okay, three total. He smoked a pack of cigarettes a day, if not more. Okay, so he was taking a cigarette break every 15 minutes. We'd finish changing the oil in a car, and he'd go out back, sit on the tire, and smoke a cigarette. Well, my boss was a deacon at his church, so I knew if I went to him and I played the God card, he'd have a hard time resisting. Right. It was the redeemed version of manipulation, okay? So I went to him, and I said, okay, Rick. His name was Rick. I said, hey, Rick, if, uh, if Herbie gets to take a cigarette break every 15 minutes, and you don't ever tell him not to, then uh, I want to take a Bible break every time he takes a cigarette break. <laughs> and, and what's he going to tell a 19-year-old kid that wants to read the Bible and not smoke cigarettes? If what kind of deacon are you, Rick, if you tell me no? I mean, I knew what I was doing, okay? So he said, as long as you get all your work orders done, that's fine. Okay, cool. I'm in. So every time little Herbie would pick up his pack of cigarettes and start packing that thing and walking out back, I'm like, okay, let's go. I'd go out. He'd sit on one tire, and I'd sit on the other tire. He'd smoke his cigarette. I'd read my Bible. And I had so many encounters with God on that tire. You can't even imagine. Sometimes I'm like, I don't know if the cloud of glory has come or if Herbie lit up another one. (laughs) You know what I mean? <laughs> but, but, but it was on a tire behind a tire shop with the smell of cigarette smoke in the air wow. that God taught me his word, wow. that he discipled me. And uh, from that point, I had met my wife. We got married. We are married for five years. I was ministering as a youth pastor in a local church in 
North Carolina, and uh, that church went through some major church drama, and it led to some serious church hurt for my wife and I, and we resigned our positions at that church and stepped away, and it had been eight years since I had uh, laid down my scholarship offer and all that kind of stuff. It had been eight years, and I, uh, I was like, God, I would have been done with school. I would have been starting right now. Why? I mean, it was the most painful, up to that point, was the most painful thing we'd ever been to through. Last year trumped that for us, by the way. Um, but painful things typically lead to an elevation in your spirit with the Lord. Because what ended up happening, it was through that pain that the Lord began to speak about going to do this internship in Kansas City. I've been going back and forth to IHOP a couple times a year because, man, every time I went, it was so just refreshed my spirit, right? So I'd go back and forth for years, 10 years or something, and uh, go to one, the One Thing conferences in December that we used to have every year and be a part of as many things as I could be a part of. And uh, long, just to shorten the story, um, the Lord's made it real clear to me, and then he also confirmed it and made it real clear to my wife. My wife is far less adventurous. I'm, I'm adventurous. It doesn't take much for, for me to sign up for something new, okay? Like, I'm like, yeah, I'm in. Skydiving, let's go, okay? You know, move to Brazil, let's go. That'd be exciting. That'd be fun. You know, I don't think too much about, like, what comes after. I'm just like, oh, that sounds adventurous. Let's go. Right? Anybody like me? Anybody like me? See, come on. There's a couple people. So the rest of you probably like my wife. You're like, that sounds terrible. <laughs> That's, I'm getting anxiety right now just thinking about it. But uh, so when the Lord made it clear to her, I knew it was him because there was no way she would say yes if she hadn't heard it from him. And so uh, we did it. We decided to go for three months. That's what we felt. And it ended up being the carrot and the rabbit trap for us, right? Like he got it right here. And we, we did the three months and then it just moved another three months. And it's like, oh, we're supposed to stay here six months. Oh, okay. So then it's like six months we complete the internship. By the end of that, we realized, okay, God's doing something and he's changing our lives. So I ended up uh, selling my landscaping business. Uh, I had a landscaping company at the time. Um, my wife was a dental hygienist, and she owned a jewelry business as well. We ended up getting rid of all of that stuff. We were getting ready to build a house. I mean, our life was like on the up and up, right? Like we were getting ready, like we were taking off, you know, 25, 26 years old, we were taking off, you know? Um, and, uh, and we sold everything and moved across the country to sit in a room and talk to an invisible God as our job. And it makes no sense when you say it like that. Because it doesn't make sense. Not in human metrics. Not in the way we view things. But God's invited us to a greater reality than the one that we live in. And he's called us to then, as we touch that greater reality called the reality of his kingdom, to then release that reality on earth as it is in heaven. And so for Winchenden, am I saying it right, Winchenden? For Winchenden, there's a company of people sitting in a room on April 20th, 29th, the day of the 29th, 30th. Happy birthday. It's John's birthday, by the way. Happy birthday. We, there's, a, there's, a, there's a group of people on April 30th, 2022, sitting in a room in Winchenden, Massachusetts, because God said, you know what? I want there to be a people who are so in touch with my kingdom that they release it on earth as it is in heaven for this city and this region. And I care enough about the people of this city and region. See, it truly isn't about you that are in the room. It's about everybody else. But a fire falls on sacrifice, right? Fire always falls on sacrifice. And part of my journey was I began to pray to the Lord in my sleep without knowing it, God, if you're not moving, I'll move you. And that sounded really offensive at first when I was saying it. I'm like, what am I even saying? But led by the Holy Spirit, God, if you're not moving, I'll move you. 
And I realized after a while when I began to engage the Lord and ask him, what does that phrase even mean? God, if you're not moving, I'll move you. I began to understand this idea of fire falling on a sacrifice. And if God wasn't moving, it was because there wasn't a sacrifice for him to fall on. Uh, and so I was telling the Lord, look, if you need a sacrifice, I'll be the living sacrifice. I'll be that. I'll, I'll lay myself out before you, not because I'm special or I think that I'm worthy of it or because of any of that, not because I deserve to even be having this conversation with you, creator, God of the universe, but because there's something inside of me that says I'm not content with the way things are and I feel like that's what you think too, God. You don't like it when families are ripped apart by drugs and alcoholism. You don't like it when there's women and children being sold into sex slavery. You don't like it when there's 70 million plus babies being murdered in the womb. You don't like it when these, all of these things are happening in the world. And, and this is not your kingdom. These are not manifestations of your kingdom. And you, you don't like it when your kingdom is not being made manifest and you want to release your kingdom through partnership and agreement with your people. And so let me be one of those who stands in agreement with you. Not trying to gain something from you or get more or get more money or get more popularity or get more friends or get more whatever, but get more of you. That's it, just you. And I think that's the essence of this idea of being a kingdom of priests, right? If you look in uh, Exodus chapter 19, I want to talk for a few moments before we break on identity and behavior, identity and behavior, the relationship between identity and behavior and, 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 and how we as a kingdom of priests, as God's people, must operate from a place of an understanding of who we are in him. So Exodus 19 um, the Israelites had, they're like three months since they were set free from Egyptian captivity. Okay, it had been about three months. And they're coming out of Egypt, or they came out of Egypt, and Moses has went up on the mountain for the first time. Uh, and, and, and this time he's just going to ask God, God, what do you want to say to this people who have just been set free? So a people who are newly free, they were slaves a minute ago, and now they're free. God, what do you want to say to them? This is kind of significant, isn't it? Like, God, what's the first thing you want to say to someone who was a slave but is now free? And in verse 4 of Exodus 19, we get God's answer to Moses. He says, you have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you will carefully listen to me, keeping my covenant, you will be my own possession out of all the peoples, although the whole earth is mine, and you will be my kingdom of priests and my holy nation. These are the words that you are to say to the Israelites, Moses. So, I'll tell a story to illustrate the point that I want to make. The Lord has connected my heart to the nation of Brazil, right? I started going to Brazil in May of 2016. I've been there, I think, eight times over these six years. And the first time I went there, the first night we were there, we went to eat at this restaurant called Sali Braza. It means salt and like burning coals, embers, right? And they basically, it's just a place, they take copious amounts of meat, right? They sprinkle it with sea salt and they roast it over a fire. Then they bring it out to you on a big skewer and ask you, how much do you want? It's like heaven, you know? I believe 
that veganism is next to demonism. <laughs> There's a reason that in the last days at the marriage supper of the lamb, it's well-aged wine and fatty meats, not hummus and crackers. <laughs> okay? So they bring out all this meat. And I'm like, yeah, let me try that. The picanha, right? Picanha is like a sirloin. It's one of my favorites. And then they bring out this thing called linguisa. And I'm like, oh, I'll try some linguisa. Give me some linguisa. Okay, so I'm going to eat the linguisa. I eat the linguisa. They're like, oh, you like linguisa? I'm like, yeah. They're like, do you know what it is? I'm like, I have no idea, but it tastes good. And they're like, oh, it's intestinal sausage. I'm like, well, it tastes good. So I'm okay. I'm good with it. I'm good with it. Then they bring out chicken hearts. Anybody ever eat a chicken heart? There you go, see? You've eaten it, yeah. Now, I didn't even know chickens had a heart, to be honest with you. <laughs> I've never met a kind chicken. I've never met a chicken that wanted to give me a hug, okay? I didn't know they had hearts. I have six chickens. I had no idea they had a heart. It seems to me like they just eat my food, you know? So I get, I get the chicken hearts. I'm like, well, just give me like, just give me like two or three of them. They're like, okay, here's two or three. And I eat, and, and I'm like, okay, we're going we're gonna to do this, right? Because I had this moment where I was like, you know, when in Rome, right? You know, Paul said, be all things to all people so that you might maybe win a few. I kind of want to win a few while I'm here, so let me just be here and be all things to all people. I'm going to act like Brazilian, and I'm going to choke down this chicken heart, right? So I, <laughs> I go to eat the chicken heart, and I eat it, and I'm like, actually, that's actually pretty good. I was like, wow, that's actually really good. And I was like, can I get some more of those? And they're like, oh, Caleb. They call me Caleb. Caleb loves chicken hearts. Look at Caleb loving chicken hearts. And I'm like, yeah, give me some more chicken hearts. I'm sitting there crushing some chicken hearts, right? Y'all, now y'all are getting hungry, aren't you? You want to take a break and go get some chicken hearts? No. And then I'm like, they, get, they do fresh coconut water, right? They literally just go out and get a coconut off the tree, chop the top off of it here, drink some coconut. Oh, that's so good. Give me coconut water. This is a really tough mission trip, huh? <laughs> what it sounds like. I get a fish and just all the food and then and then. I love the Portuguese language, and I'm like, oh, this first trip, I'm leading worship. I want to try to sing some songs in Portuguese, and I guarantee it wasn't very good Portuguese, but I sang in Portuguese, and they were like, oh, Caleb. By the end of the trip, the pastor's wife, we're sitting at dinner for the last night before I leave the next day, and the pastor's wife looks at me and says, Caleb is not American. Caleb is Brazilian. <laughs> because they saw I was engaged in the culture. But let me ask you a question, serious question. Do I look Brazilian to you? <laughs> you can take you look take one look at me and know that guy is not Brazilian, right? I'm not Brazilian. I'm an American. I could do all the stuff that a Brazilian does and even enjoy it and want to do it, and that does not change my citizenship. Let me put it to you this way: When I was a kid, I had a wild and active imagination. I always wanted to be a spy. Right. I mean, I had this period of three or four years where I was like James Bond, Ethan Hunt, super spy. I was the guy. Right. Every birthday, Christmas, I was asking for spy gear. Eight years old. Mom, will you get me a, a pen that I could put in my pocket that has a hidden camera in it? And she's like, son, you are eight years old. Why would you have a pen in your pocket? That's not being a good spy. And I'm like, I, it has a camera in it. And I think it's cool. Mom, can I have one? Right? Walkie-talkies, sunglasses with, pic with cameras in it. All this, I'd collect the spy gear. I'd spy on my sisters, right? I'd go in, sneak in. I'd put one of the walkie-talkies in my mom's room where she was cleaning, right? And I'd turn it on. That way she could hear me. And I'd sneak in. I'd go to, you know, make sure they couldn't see me get in the closet. Kirk, mom. Headquarters, mom. Kirk. <laughs> Hannah's playing with the dolls again. Kirk. I was a spy. I got really good at it. Now, let me ask you a question. Am I a spy? No. You don't know that. <laughs> if I was, I wouldn't tell you. If I told you, I'd have to kill you, right? I'm not a spy. At least I don't want you to think I am. I wasn't, a, I wasn't a spy. I'm not a spy. I could do all the things that spies do. I had all the spy gear. I loved the idea of being a spy. But there was just because I had the behaviors of a spy did not make me a spy. 
See, just because I had the behaviors of a Brazilian, it did not make me a Brazilian. Why are these things true? Because there is a foundational principle that we have to understand. And that is that behavior does not determine identity. Let me say it again. Behavior does not determine identity. But your identity should determine your behavior. There's a, um, there's a, a verse in Proverbs 22, verse 6, that says, Train a child up in the way they should go, and even when he is old, he will not depart from it. Y'all know this passage? Any parenting seminar, you probably heard this passage. Train a child up. And, and most of the time, I think the church has done a really bad job of interpreting what this text actually means, because what we tell people that it means so often is Andrew make sure that you raise your child up with good behaviors and good ethics and good moral character yeah Cowboys fans right that's actually (laughs) raise a child up in the way they should never go see but I would say it about the Patriots too But actually what this text means is raise a child up in the way they should go. It means get to know your child and who God made them to be. Who did God create them to be? Because here's the deal. If you just raise a child up with good morals and good character and good behavior, how many times do we have the testimony of the last part of that not becoming true? You raise a child up with good behavior and good morals, and then once the enforcer is out of the picture, they rebel. Because they were taught good behaviors, but they were never taught who they are. What is their identity? And so their identity is still in question. And I'm not trying to shame anybody. I'm not trying to like, I'm not trying to say anything. I'm just saying the church has done a bad job of helping us understand what this text means. What it actually means is get God's heart and what he says about that kid and tell that kid all the days of their life who God says they are and help them to discover who God says they are. And when they grow up, they'll never stop being that. The moment, so I got three babies, and the way I got these three babies is crazy, okay? It's crazy. So my wife and I were married nine years, biologically could not have children, okay? We were infertile, right? The percentages were so low, they said, you might as well stop trying. I said, I'm not going to stop trying. That was inappropriate. It was a joke. Sorry. I'm a married man. It's okay. They said, you might as well stop trying. And we said, you know, well, the Lord in 2008, a year before we got married, had put adoption in our heart. But we had always had this idea that we would uh, have our own kids first and then adopt, right? That's what we thought we would do. Well, the Lord in 2016 um, supernaturally spoke to me and said, Caleb, how can I trust you with any of my little ones if you won't call them all your own? And so we began the adoption process then. It took two years, but we finally got matched with a little baby girl that was going to be born at the end of February of 2018, right? She ended up coming a week late on March 6th, um, a month before. That's, that, her name's Isla. She's our beautiful little girl, our four-year-old. Um, a month before she was born, we went to have the health check done for our adoption home study, and they found out my wife was pregnant, <laughs> And so (laughs) I literally laughed out loud for two weeks (laughs) straight. (laughs) I was just like driving down the road. Ah, (laughs) It was just so weird and funny and terrifying and awesome and all the things. And and, uh, so I... um, We had Isla, got her four hours after she was born on March 6th. 
And then seven months later, we had Ivy. And then about a year and a half later, September 2020, we had Zion, my little boy. Uh, also biological son, right? Um, when my girls were born, I immediately, the second they rolled Isla into the room, I looked at her. Now, Isla is half black, half white, okay? She looked just like me. Figure that one out. <laughs> Okay, she really did. It's true. And uh, I looked at her and I picked her up and I knew immediately, this is my princess. She's my princess. And I made a decision. The same with Ivy, you know. The first time I held Ivy, I looked at her, red hair, you know, just like dad. I looked at her, that's my princess. Princess Isla, Princess Ivy. Now, what kind of father would I be if I gave them an identity as a princess? And then when they start to misbehave, what if I told them, hey, you want to be a princess, don't you? Don't you want to be a princess? If you want to be a princess, you can't do that. If you want to be a princess, you can't act that way. What kind of father would I be to call into question an identity that I gave them? They didn't give themselves that identity. I gave it to them. I called them princess. So how can they remove something from themselves that was not from themselves in the first place? Instead, I get down on their level. I look at them in the eye and I say, Isla, you are a princess. And one of daddy's jobs is to help you learn how to act like who you are. So come here. Let me show you what a princess does in this situation. She almost always comes. Now, I'm not a ch world champion father, okay? My kids hit each other and steal toys and scream and pitch tantrums and do all the stuff, okay? So I'm not claiming to have it, like, hacked. But I am saying, I will never be a father that calls my child's identity into question when they do something they're not supposed to do. Why? Because my heavenly father has never once done that to me. And if he won't do it to me, I don't get to do it to them. So it's raise a child up in the way they should go. It's, it's find out who they are. Because I guarantee you, my Isla and my Ivy, if they know their whole life that daddy called them a princess and they start to believe it and they start to believe that they're a princess, then when they grow up, they're not going to let some boy that's not a prince mess with them. Right? They're going to know who they are. And from who they are will flow what they do. So, who does God say that we are? Who does God say that we are? That's where it starts. Because if you don't know who you are, then you'll never consistently do the things that you are supposed to do. And so many of us, we try so hard to overcome sin. Or it, maybe it's not even a sin thing. Maybe we're just trying to even do our sacred trust, right? Like some of y'all, I'm so proud of y'all for doing a sacred trust. Like saying, Lord, we're going to commit to you. Like we're all in. But like it's hard. And you do it in weakness. And it's like, you, it's like some days you want to come and some days you don't. And some days that you don't want to come, you don't come, right? And it's like, ah, oh, I did it again and you're just like trying to do it. and it's like my heart for you guys today at the worship room right my heart for you today is to get away from worrying about whether you're doing all the right things and get in touch with who he says you are and if you'll get in touch with who he says you are as a kingdom of priests, if you'll get in touch with that reality, let that reality in turn upon your heart, the truth of God on you, so that then when, when he reveals that to you and gives it to you at that level of clarity, then it's just going to start flowing out of you. It's, not, it's, gonna be a, it's gonna be who you are. You don't have to try to be who you are. You got to try to be somebody different. 
right? It's like when I get tired, my guard goes, comes down a little bit. My filter goes away a little bit because I'm not trying so hard to impress people, right? I start talking a little more Southern when I get tired. I sound like a redneck when I get tired. I start saying things and thinking things are funny and laughing out loud at things that are not funny at all. Like it's just, but, but it's more authentically me because I've lost the ability to try to be what I think other people want me to be, and I just be me. That's what I hope happens to you today and this weekend. I hope God wrecks you so much on the inside with who he says you are that you walk out of this place not wanting to be anything else. With a prosperous soul that says, you know what? I don't care what people think about me. Jesus, right? Jesus is standing in a house. He's teaching. He's surrounded by these religious intellectual people, right? This guy wants to be healed of being paralyzed. He can't walk, though. So he's got four friends carry him, carrying him in on a rug. And they can't get in because all these religious intellectual people are standing in the way. You know, that's usually the problem, <laughs> The people that need to get to Jesus because they need Jesus, usually they got to go through a crowd of religion and intellect. Right? <laughs> well, they're like, I'm not going to dig through this crowd. The friends are like, we're not going to dig through this crowd. We're going to dig through the roof. That sounds easier. <laughs> Right, So they get on top of the house and they start digging through this roof. It's probably like a combination of mud and sticks and all that kind of stuff and rocks. They're digging through the roof, right? Suddenly they break through the roof and there's Jesus and they got this big hole and they're just boom and rocks are falling and wood's falling and mud's falling and probably hit some of it fell on Jesus and Jesus is standing there and he's looking up and he's like, and this is probably his house or a friend of his house and they just destroyed the roof. <laughs> And you notice Jesus don't say anything about that. Jesus doesn't say anything about the roof. Because Jesus' soul prospered. He knew who he was. So he wasn't worried about a roof. He knew what was going on. Because his soul prospered, his discernment was off the charts. Because his soul prospered. You know, 3 John 2 says that, you're, that you will prosper in all things just as your soul prospers. There is a connection between the prosperity of your soul and everything that goes on and happens around you. If your soul is sick, then you'll be sick and everything you touch will be sick. If your soul is prospering, you will prosper and everything you touch will prosper. It's really simple. But simple doesn't mean easy, <laughs> Right? Jesus knew who he was, and that was a big part of his soul prospering. He knew who he was. And so he wasn't worried about what it was going to cost to fix that roof. He wasn't worried when they lowered him in and all of these religious people start looking around like, what's he going to do? And then he says, hey, man, your sins are forgiven. That's the first thing he says. Your sins are forgiven. I wonder if he was forgiving him for tearing the roof up, you know, Maybe, probably part of it. Your sins are forgiven. All these guys that are looking around like, oh, and because his soul prospered, again, his discernment was off the charts. He knew what they were thinking and how they were responding. And inside they were thinking, who does he think he is for giving people of sins? Only God can do that. And so before they even have a chance to say something, he preemptively strikes and he says, what do you think's easier? Asking this man to rise up and walk or forgiving him of sin? And he doesn't even let him answer. He's like, because guess what? I'm going to do both. Take your mat. You can go. The guy stands up and walks out. And everybody marvels at what just happened. See, Jesus' prosperity of soul led to a prosperity of discernment, a prosperity of not caring what everyone else in the room thought about what he was about to do. There's another example of him spitting in a guy's eye so that the guy would have sight. There's another example of him healing a woman who'd been bent over her whole life, but in order for her to, him to heal her, he's standing at the front, and he tells her in the back, hey, can you come here? 
That seems really insensitive and lacking compassion, right? The bent lady that can barely walk, and he's saying, hey, I want to heal you, but you're going to have to walk across this whole room and get to me. How many times did Jesus do something that seemed to be rude, right? But he didn't care. He wasn't worried about what people thought about him because he knew who he was. His soul prospered, and because his soul prospered, Everything he did and everything he touched prospered. Everybody Jesus prayed for to be healed was healed. Every city he went into, it says if there were sick people and they came, they were healed. If there were demon-possessed people and they came, they were set free. Everything, all things, he prospered in all things just as his soul prospered because he knew who he was. So that begs the question then, who are we? Who are you? Ask that question. Who am I? Out loud. Who am I? John 1.12 says we are children of God. John 15.15 15 says we are friends of God. Romans 8.37 says we are more than conquerors. Colossians 3.12 says we are chosen, holy, and dearly loved. Philippians 3.20 says we are citizens of heaven. Galatians 3.13 says we are the redeemed. Ephesians 1.18 says we are saints. 1 Peter 2.9 says we are a holy nation. And Revelation 1.6 says we are a kingdom of priests. Our root identity is we are ones created in his image. We are image bearers. And the first function of an image bearer is to operate in the identity of a priest. I believe this is where it started in the garden. He said he created Adam and Eve, put them in the garden, and their job was to watch over it, keep it. What was the garden? It was a place where God would come and walk in the cool of the day with man. He would meet with man. God and man would be together in the garden. Tabernacle literally just means meeting place. The tabernacle of worship, the tabernacle of David, the tabernacle of Moses. These things, they were simply called tents of meeting. Places where God's people and God could come together and meet. And when the Levites are told what to do with the tabernacle, it says their job when they were commissioned as priests was to watch over it, work it, and keep it, just like Adam was instructed to do in the garden. So the very first identity given to man in the garden was the identity of a priest. His job was to meet with God. Not out of a place of, I need, he didn't, he, and he worked in the garden, and, 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 and he maintained the garden, and he made sure that the place where God's people could meet with God was kept uh, uh, beautiful and nice, and he had a job to name the animals, but he wasn't doing any of those things to obtain provision. He wasn't working because he had to make money to feed himself. Everything was supplied. This was God's intended design. Everything supplied. You work out of a place of identity, not out of a place of need. Work out of a place of identity. Everything is supplied by me. And you simply spend your life meeting with me as a priest and facilitating that meeting for other people. And so then when sin comes in, that identity gets corrupted. And God highlights a nation of people, the nation of Israel, to reestablish that identity in them. And three months, like we said in Exodus 19, three months after they are set free from Egyptian captivity, the first thing that God says directly to that nation is the identity statement. Hey, at the very beginning, before you start doing anything else, Israel, you're still kicking it around in the desert with no purpose and no meaning. The first thing you need to know about yourself from me is that you are my kingdom of priests. The job of Israel was to meet 
face to face with God and then be the worship leaders of the earth who would lead all the nations of the earth into worship of Yahweh. That's what a priest does is they meet with God. They know God. They seek his face. They seek the identity, the character, and the nature of God because he's worthy to be known and he desires to be known. And how can you know who you are if you're an image bearer? How can you know who you are if you don't know who he is? If you don't know who he is, how can you ever know truly who you are? That's why the first identity statement given over the Israelites was you've got to be priests first. You've got to know me not just what I do. We're going to talk about in the afternoon session how they got themselves into idolatry because they tried to worship him for what he had done for them rather than for who he is. They wanted to worship and praise him for the benefits disconnected from the identity. And that's what we'll talk about in the afternoon session. So I want to close with this. You guys, let's just stand Andrew, if you want to just come tinker on the Yamaha. The only reason I want him to play is because it makes me sound more spiritual when there's music in the background, and that helps. What I really just want us to do is I just want us to ask Holy Spirit to remind us of who we are. There's no right or wrong way to respond right now. But I just want you... Maybe just lift your, maybe just hold your hands out in front of you. Close your eyes, hold your hands out in front of you like you're getting a gift. Like, 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 like somebody's handing you a present. Some of you, some of you are expecting a big gift. Some of you are expecting a little gift. And what he wants to do is he wants to give you a gift that reveals who you are again. I believe the Holy Spirit with all the things that he's doing in the church, in this nation, there's primarily one reality that he's restoring to his bride, and that's the priestly identity. It's the identity of knowing him and being known by him. And, and being the stewards of places of meeting where people can meet God. And when people meet God, everything changes. Everything changes in cities and towns and regions all over the world when people start to meet God. But God moves in partnership and agreement with people. And that's, that's why there needs to be a company of those who are secure in their priestly identity in Winchendon, Massachusetts. That's why because God loves this place, but he won't do what he wants to do in this place unless there's a people who will agree with him, who will partner with him to release it. And I believe there's churches all over this city and this region that want that. They wanna do that. And I believe the worship room is a ministry that is here to, 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 to act as the air force to, to the, the local church that is the ground troop, right? They're fighting on the ground face to face with people who are dealing with addiction, who are dealing with divorce, who are dealing with all of these painful things. And they're, you know, these pastors and these leaders, when they've got a hard job and they need support in the air, at the level of the spirit, at the level of the atmosphere. And that's what you guys are here for, is to make war in the heavens as a kingdom of priests who knows who you are. You know who you are. Just let it reawaken in you. Just let it come alive again in you. You know who you are. He told you a long time ago who you were. 
somehow you let this heaviness just rest on you because of all these expectations from other people or other ministries or pain or things you've been through relationships people that have hurt you people that have done things all these things you've let all this stuff weigh on you and clutter your understanding of who you are and father we're here right now and we're asking you break in with the voice of your holy spirit and reveal to this beloved kingdom of priests this company of priests god reveal to their heart again afresh and anew who you you are and let it melt away all that junk I pray that their souls prosper I pray that their souls prosper Jesus that they would contend in intercession from a place of confidence and agreement not from a place of fear that their prayers would not be fueled by doubt or worry or fear, but they would be fueled by agreement. God, I know you want to do it. God, I know you want to heal the sick. I know you want to raise the dead. I know you want to uh, cleanse the leper. God, I know you want to do it. I know you want to do it. I know you want to do it. And because I know who you are, I know who I am. And now I know how to cooperate with you in the process of seeing all of these come to pass. This city, this region is destined to be a place where the presence of God rests. But fire falls on sacrifice. Somebody's got to go first. And that's you guys. God's saying, just go first. Just go in first. Just go into the throne room of God first. Be a kingdom of priests that leads because everyone has the identity of the priest. If you are a born again believer, you are a priest now. There is no delineation. There is no separation. Now you may have an occupation that's different. There's the occupation of a priest. We'll talk about that later today. But at an identity level, you have full access. You can walk straight into the throne room of the living God right now and make your requests known and he will listen and he will respond. When Jesus ascended after his death, burial, and resurrection, he ascended to the right hand of, the, of God. The last thing he looked back and told Peter was he said, hey, Peter, follow me. And he told him that a bunch of times, but Peter hadn't yet understood because he thought it meant follow my principles, follow me physically on the ground as I walk places what he was saying was no I'm actually going to a place that man has never been before I'm going into the eternal holy of holies that heavenly throne room Peter Peter I'm about to go in there follow me <laughs> follow me because of what I'm about to do Peter now you can go to a place where people were not previously allowed access you are now allowed access and if you are in him in Christ then you right now are allowed access into the very throne room of heaven and you think your life's boring and you think you need a better job and you think you need a nicer car or a nicer house or a different girlfriend? Come on. You got all you ever need. You literally have access to the throne room of heaven right now. So let's just worship for a moment as we close this morning session, let's just worship for a moment. Worship is the eternal expression of the priestly identity. In a billion years, we'll still be doing this. Long after the last sermon has been preached, long after the last sick man has been healed, long after the last homeless person has been given clothes, we will still be worshiping. This is the eternal expression of humanity. What we're about to do, simply singing songs to a beautiful God and entering into his courts with praise, entering into his presence, simply doing that is eternally significant. So let's go in. <laughs>